these words constrain constraint means uh, you are going to uh, constrain the normal limb uh, obviously when you ask a patient to lift your hand up normally what uh, arm he lifts is the normal hand he knows that you are asking him to lift the affected limb but still he uses only the normal hand this is called as patient's ego neurologically when you are not able to do certain activity when a person is asking you to do an activity irrespective of he being a physiotherapist or a medical professional the patient's ego uh, uh, what to say that, um, that that can be said as um, uh, the self respect of the patient is in uh, stake because he is not able to lift this hand all these years in his life he has been lifting this hand but now he is not able to lift the hand so what he does is he tries to lift the normal hand and show that his at least one half of his side is normal but most of the time the physiotherapist say when i say to lift your hand don't lift your normal hand you lift your abnormal hand so this terminology also i i very strongly um, object to use in terms of uh, treating stroke patients because uh, being a therapist you should not use this word affected and unaffected always use this word right and left to uh, uh, mention which hand you want to lift so ask him that i don't want you to lift your right hand now lift your left hand which is uh, what i want to see then he will try to lift it but he won't be able to do it so what i'm trying to say here is the moment you give some objects to handle the moment you ask the patient to lift they do it with the intact side so how to make them do it on the affected side just to constrain the unaffected side just give some sort of a sling or anything or immobilizer to constrain this normal side so that he starts moving the affected side and then um, this constraint because of constraint there is an induction of the movement of the affected extremity you are inducing the affected extremity to move so constraint induced movement therapy that is the split ex uh, explanation of this uh, thing so who all can use actually this was first invented for cerebral palsy children who who are very mischievous and uh, it's very difficult to compel them to use the uh, uh, their affected body part so it was initially uh, invented for cerebral palsy children and uh, uh, particularly the hemiplegic cerebral palsy children next it can, it can be used for hemiplegia in, due to cerebrovascular accident uh, traumatic brain injury spinal cord injury patients and multiple sclerosis patients can also use this please don't say i have used constraint induced movement therapy for uh, lower motor neuron lesion or a uh, uh, lesion where there is a weakness of a particular muscle or weakness of muscles which are supplied by a particular nerve peripheral nerve because here there won't be a problem of uh, usage uh, because the patient is going to be highly alert uh, in terms of higher mental function so he will not have this problem and he knows that if only he moves he will be able to bring about the control of that particular body part so don't use it for lower motor neuron lesion use it always for a upper motor neuron lesions what are the components of constraint induced movement therapy so you are to restrain uh, the affected extremity subsequently um once you restrain the uh, affected extremity the patient is going to uh, move the unaffected extremity sorry uh, he is going to move the affected extremity so there is something called as massing of repetitive structured practice intensive therapy so uh, these things we are coming up uh, subsequently so there should be a structured practice when i say uh, a massing of a repetitive means you have to give a good amount of repetition to the patient and the repetition should be how it should be it should not be abnormal attempt in doing a movement it should be a structured practice maybe a guided practice from the therapist or a visually guided uh, practice in front of a mirror or um, uh, guided uh, movement uh, with the proximal stability and you are asking the patient to move the distal extremity or whatever it is it should be a structured practice 
and it should be an intensive therapy. It cannot be 15 minutes, 20 minutes a day. It should be very intensive. That is two hours, three hours continuously. So then only the patient will be forced to use the uh, extremity. Uh, there are two types of uh, usage of the extremity in a constraint induced movement therapy where, uh, uh, for example, you are asking, uh, you are giving a task to a patient and the patient is performing the task that is out of compulsion he is doing. There are situations when the patient might feel very thirsty. There are situations where the patient may feel some itching on his uh, shoulder. So that time when he, he want to use the un, uh, unaffected extremity, but that is constrained, this guy attempts to do the uh, affected extremity movement. Uh, he tries to uh, push something or he tries to uh, take a glass of water. But the major problem here is he goes for an abnormal pattern, whatever is available in the affected limb. So there should always be a person who is monitoring the patient and emphasizing him in moving on a normal uh, uh, movement sequence for mastering that because positive reinforcement should be given only for normal movement pattern and not for the abnormal movement pattern. If we do so, then there is going to be a good recovery. Otherwise, if the patient is left alone with this constraint and he starts at, uh, achieving all his movements uh, or day-to-day -day activities by means of an abnormal movement pattern, and again, you're going to fail very miserably. Monitoring arm use in life situation. That is very, very important. Constraining this arm, you should not ask the patient to lift a dumbbell upwards, sidewards, backwards. So that is not needed. That is a situation that is not a real life situation. How often uh, this patient have been using dumbbells in his day to day life? That is not there. Don't ask the patient to sit on a Swiss ball. Uh, after constraining the upper limb. That is not needed for the patient. You have to involve some real life situation. For example, getting up from the chair and going and sitting on the bed and then subsequently lying down without the use of the affected, uh, unaffected extremity. See, these are the life situations. Um, very simple. Uh, I have seen patients who are finding it very difficult to take the bed sheet and cover themselves during the night time for which they used to uh, wake their uh, uh, caretakers because of which the caretakers used to get angry. You can't even take one bed sheet and cover yourself. Then what is the deal? Because sleep is very important for everyone. Uh, this small uh, activity of inability to wrap the patient's body can disturb the uh, caretakers and the caretakers start giving a negative emotion to the patient and this depresses the patient and the patient will go on to a deep rooted uh, uh, depression and he will not move at all. So these are all very important vital things you have to sit with the patient and discuss with the patient and the patient's attenders. So, what I'm trying to say is monitoring the arm use in real life situation is very important and it should be a problem solving one. That is what I told you. It should solve some of the problems of the patient overcoming the perceived barriers in the uh, perceived barriers in the sense expo uh, exploring the uh, environment or going about and doing their activity, becoming independent uh, from the uh, uh, attenders or the caretakers effort is going to be the vital for the uh, stroke patients. And the behavioral agreement is very important here. Uh, behavioral agreement is if the patient is not uh, accepting to be on a constraint for a longer period of duration, uh, you have to give the patient a taste of success, give them small periods of uh, uh, constraint induced movement therapy and gradually ramp it up. If in case there is no behavioral agreement, that is the patient also should accept with you that this is going to help. I'm going to cooperate. If the patient is not cooperating, even if you constrain the unaffected limb, the patient will be completely uh, inactive and he will also not use the affected extremity and he will not use the unaffected extremity also. So behavioral agreement and consensus is very, very important in, ter in terms of constraining this movement therapy where the patient should feel that the therapist and the caretakers are doing this only for the betterment of the patient, not for the, uh, not to trouble him as such. 
and you should always have a treatment diary. How many hours a day the patient has been uh, constrained and how was the movement before and how was the uh, after uh, constrainment for three hours or two hours. This diary have to be maintained a Barthel index or a uh, functional independence measure scale or some scale along with the quality uh, of life scale can also be administered to patients to know how these patients are progressing. If the patients are not progressing, there is some problem in the um, the massing of reputation, structure, practice, and intensity of the therapy, and you have to alter that.